3D is now the major driver when it comes to any movies that are coming out from Hollywood. So the first question I want to pose out there is what can the video game industry, which is also now entering the 3D realm with NVIDIA on the PC side, Sony on the PlayStation 3 side, and soon Nintendo on the 3DS side, learn from what Hollywood has already established over the last couple of years? And I'll start off and we'll just we'll start with... Uh, from what Hollywood has done. Uh, I'm, 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 I don't know if we have a lot we can learn. I think that there are things that are different about what we do and what they do. Um, one of the things that's true about 3D is it's an incremental cost in, in Hollywood that it's borne mostly by the developers of the movie initially when the movie is made. There, there was the cost of outfitting the, the theaters, but for the most part, the experience never suffers once it's crafted. In our case today, on a PlayStation 3 or on a 360, you're going to pay between a 30 and a 50% hit in your CPU and GPU performance just to simply implement 3D. And so today it operates essentially as a tax on game performance that's continuous and impacts every player out there. And that's really what's fundamentally different than what the experience that we have to deal with than what Hollywood does. At the same time, the, the thing that I think was the most interesting from CES this year, I think I looked at every single piece of 3D hardware that was shown at CES, either on the floor or off the floor. Um, and it came strikingly clear that, it, that the technology was absolutely meaningless without content. The difference between great content on mediocre technology was way better than mediocre content on great technology. There was just no substitute for good stuff. Prior to Avatar, um, I don't think Hollywood really, was really into the whole 3D craze as far as producing films and things of that sort. But after Avatar, as you see, every 2D movie is form being reformatted to 3D. Uh, Whether it should be or not. Exactly. <laughs> it, it becomes some sort of a gimmick to some movies. Some directors don't like it, but I think it's all about the content, even when you make the transition to 3D gaming. Mm -hmm. you know, what's going to be available for regular consumers? How, how can we open 3D up to, uh, for consumers to even be interested if the prices of formatted TVs and consoles? And we really saw it take off in Hollywood first. It was in the animated movies, really. And, and then we look at it like, why? You know, and so everyone's looking to have a new bell and whistle for attraction power, right? And that's largely what we're facing again today and we're saying in the game space. There's, on one hand, having done, made 3D films in the past, uh, there's a whole sort of technical understanding that does come, carry over. You know, there's all kinds of orientation and there's issues of uh, what makes it work, what makes it not work, and you know, um, accounting for those. And then what makes it too much? In many ways, the, the sort of orientation viewer related uh, sciences are very similar. You know, that carries over, but I think Rich nailed it in the beginning saying, you know, it's a very different space with very different audiences and very different challenges. Yeah. When consumers are asked, you know, what do they do, want to do with 3D, the number one answer is always, I want to watch movies, right? So movies are driving the adoption uh, of 3D. And so, how can I, as a, as a video game marketer, understand what that adoption is like, because we know that they are interested in utilizing it as a gaming platform. Um, but how can I understand you know, what, what the adoption uh, uh, of the, all of the things required to you know, enjoy a 3D experience um, is, is going to take, and where is that happening? The good news is that most of it's happening in North America, um, and so the opportunity is the greatest here. Um, but that opportunity is you know, I think by the end of the year, they say, and it, depending on the report that you read, it's probably anywhere from three to five million TVs uh, are going to be shipped. So there's sort of a, a, a limit, you know, to, to how much opportunity there is um, now. But looking forward, as we, you know, talk to our dev teams about feature sets and things that we want to implement, um, you know, two years down the road, um, that, you know, starts to become very relevant. Can I riff off that? Yep. This has been kind of an interesting conversation. The, the initial conversations, at least at my pub publisher, were all oriented around the home consoles and how the 3D television market was going to impact that. But, but in truth, you know, Nintendo's announcement is uh, probably an order of magnitude more significant for a couple of reasons. Number one is in unit volume. In North America, they're probably going to ship more 3DSs than they're going to ship 3D televisions. So simply in pure numbers, it outswamps it. Number two is 3D television, console penetration, probably something in the order of 28%, where the number of game players on a 3DS, I'm fairly sure it's 
I'm not exactly sure, but I'm mm -hmm. fairly sure if you buy a 3DS, you intend to buy a game. I think that's part of the program. So I, I, a lot of this, I think, we've gotten wrapped up with the movie side of it, but the real mover on the game side is actually in the 18-inch experience without glasses um, and probably in a finer um, uh, in a smaller form factor, at least for the next two years. That's going to be the guy that actually sells the most 3D games by probably an order of magnitude. So I don't, I don't know how big that, we, we're not sure necessarily how big that opportunity is because when we look at the data, we look at active gamers, <clears throat> when do they plan on, how interested are they in the, in the 3DS and when are they looking to get into the 3D market? It's usually, I think, over 50% of them say within the next two years, absolutely, they are getting into the 3D. Mm -hmm. But when you go to the broader market, the broader casual market where you know, the bigger opportunity is, um, about 50% of them don't know. They yeah. don't know because there's still a lot of confusion about what exactly is 3D. Well, and, and we how do I do it and, and, and mm -hmm. all that stuff. And movies, develop, you know, movies have delivered their compelling experience, mm -hmm. their reason to mm -hmm. buy. We haven't done that yet. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's true. But one of the things that is confusing to a lot of consumers, and even when we look at the 3DS versus the PS3 or the uh, NVIDIA 3D Vision, is auto stereoscopic, which means playing without glasses, and stereoscopic. And I want to get your thoughts on how you see that playing out moving forward. Uh, and, and to the, the mainstream consumer, I mean, are, are they going to go out and buy a TV that's going to be obsolete in a couple of years? We need to have compelling reasons to buy products, and, and to a great extent, technologies like this impact our business when they change the way that we can make games for our customers. So the difference is, as an information system, I'm not sure how valuable it is. So let me, let me take you through a thought process here. John Madden football or FIFA, a game like that, is played from a perspective that's usually something on the order of a camera position that's between 75 and 100 yards away from the field. And the nature of that change means that 3D doesn't matter very much because there isn't a lot of wide dimension that's expressed in that game. In the context of a game like basketball, though, I'd make the case there might be a chance. To, to the greatest extent, these 3D systems need to be part of the information system of playing the game. If they don't contribute to that, we're going to have a hard time getting there because they're not adding the value that the customer perceives when they actually play the game. But in terms of the glasses, glasses versus non-glasses, um, I think what, what we're seeing is that overwhelmingly um, consumers want to ask favor uh, 3D and, and you know many or almost a quarter have, have had a 3D um, experience and they know that the glasses are required. So when we look at that, we don't we don't see consumers saying, oh, you know, the glasses are a, a pain. They they're more concerned about and this was with the avid gamers and casual gamers uh, um, the like um, is the cost um, for your home 3D experience are going to be about 150 bucks. And that's a that's a that, that's a investment. Sharp makes a 3D camera that has a 3D display on it. Turns out it's exactly the 3DS's display. Hmm. Um, so you get the hmm. chance to kind of get a look at it if you want to before the machine comes out. Sharp also makes a little picture frame that goes with it. And what you discover is that that magic that's a magic size because it's basically about that big. The minute you take it to that big, it stops mm -hmm. working. Mm -hmm. Basically, your point of vision is not fixed, and so all of a sudden you get all kinds of distortions. And in particular, you get these odd convergence problems that can physically make you sick. And so most of the glasses list ones suffer from this problem where they really demand you be in a very particular place to work, and any extended exposure actually can make you ill. Mm -hmm. I think it, that glasses list displays will matter in advertising, where your time attention span is 20 or 30 seconds, but I doubt they're going to matter in gaming for a while until we overcome that problem. And you had asked, you know, where's this going? Right. right. And, and there's a couple of ways to look at it. You know, one is, what's the, what's the ultimate sort of destination? Where's this stuff probably going to fall out? We're talking right now about a 1.0 version, really. You know? Not to get into the geek argument of, well, there was smell of vision you know, It's 1.0. And uh, so really, w what's taking place? If we look at a quick sort of evolution of the gaming space, we saw it was two-dimensional two -dimensional imagery on two-dimensional screens. Right? Now what happens? We have evolu evolving technology. We have three-dimensional imagery that's looking more like real life on a two-dimensional screen. Right? The natural progression of this is towards an augmented reality. Right? At one time when you bought your pair of eyeglasses, right? and you know, we, we're not sure how many people are wearing eyeglasses right here on this panel, because one might be in context. Right? But when you bought eyeglasses, at one point in time, you used to have to buy a separate pair of sunglasses. There comes a point in time where you go, people don't want to change their glasses. And now sunglasses and eyeglasses can be made as one. Or even reading awesome. glasses, too. Yes. The 3D experience 
is really sort of, um, you know, we're, we're looking at the lobed fin fish 1.0 version of the media experience becoming indistinguishable from the real life experience, right? So the augmented reality version is maybe it's 5.0, maybe it's 4.0, but that's where it's going. And so the technologies that are the infrastructure to this, we've seen this throughout the evolution of the game industry, not to like get sidetracked, and I'm sorry for being verbose on this, but in the evolution of the game industry, we're really watching an emulation, an, an emulation of what happened in the military sector. And we look at what, what did these guys need to control that type of a plane that's pulling these G-forces? What kind of controls and mechanisms are necessary? How do we need more dimensional reading so that targeting is accurate or whatever? And we're seeing now that this 1.0 is really a revitalization of things that were happening 20, 25 years ago in that space. And it's trickling into entertainment, which is sort of the inevitable path. But I think where it's going gets far more interested than where it is now, but where it is now is going to need this early user adaptation to start to saturate a market to create a greater appetite to you know, let it evolve further. Right. Mm. And, and Hollywood's done a really good job when it comes to marketing 3D very quickly so that people now when they go to movies are actually looking, seeking out 3D versions of films. What uh, are some things when it comes to marketing of 3D games that game companies can potentially do? How, you can, how can you take advantage of 3D when it comes to marketing, especially when you have now a lot of PCs and laptops that are 3D through, mm -hmm. through the 3D vision, you're gonna have the Nintendo 3DS next year and you're gonna basically have PlayStation 3 right now that can support 3D. Mm -hmm. um, so the number, one, um, the, the, the number one thing that moves the dial the most um, with regards to consumers and adoption of 3D is um, experience. They really need to experience 3D um, in order to to really understand you know, what, it, what it is. So we as marketers have to figure out a way um, to get this technology, this stuff in people's hands, and then uh, implement a, and this sort of revolves around the whole social theme of this conference, we need to get people talking to each other about that experience. Um, and we can utilize things like Facebook, and we can utilize things like uh, some of the things that uh, people have been talking about in this conference already um, to do that. But we have to bring those things together, but it all really starts uh, with an experience. Um, I think that's probably, for us, uh, the strongest um, marketing tool that we have. Um, and it, it certainly seems um, to, uh, to, to move the dial or increase purchase intent more than any other thing um, that we've seen up to, to this point. I, I think there's, our, our friends at Crytek have had kind of an interesting angle on this. Their notion has been that it's about player performance. That, that initially for them, the way they're going to impact their opinion leaders is to make the case that a 3D immersive experience on three screens gives you a tactical advantage playing the game versus other people in a multiplayer context. Mm -hmm. That is a well-trodden ma marketing path that works almost always for the opinion leaders in our business. And the question is, how deep is that audience and how big is the paycheck they're willing to pay for that? Right. And then a completely different take on it is the one we're doing, which is uh, first stage, you know, anytime you're, you're investing in content or product, you know, what's your install base? So the install base right now is not something you can really target and say, yeah, we're going to make money there, right? But uh, in our company, a few different times, we look at new technology and we try to ride that ride as a showcase. Because, there, you know, how much of this whole conference is about virality and, and, you know, social scalability? So we go, well, there's a need. I mean, when someone sends us 3D glasses in a, in a box and says, here, try this, and it's free, you know, they're not sending us away, right? Like they know that's going to fly, <laughs> but, they, but when they don't know if it's going to fly, they want their, their early adapting technology. Yeah, when it works, they content. take it away from us. It's yeah, it's, it's good. They're like, give us, give us that shit back, man. Come on. And uh, but so what we look at is we're we're going. Oh, okay. How many marketing dollars? So we see it as an opportunity for virility in the beginning, right? Well, what's happening? The way we see it, the social network is dimensional. Let's add dimensional dimension to the social network, and. Um, but it's not that we're necessarily addressing the audience with 3D first as much as we're addressing the audience of people who need to sell 3D first. So if we can be a showcase product, then we get in front of all these impressions at all the conferences, at all the you know, shows you know, globally. They, they want this stuff to take off everywhere. So part of an aim can be on a um, very sort of selfish you know, marketing objective to be like, we can get a lot of visibility by being attached to 3D, even if it's not in the audience yet, if you have the showcase. I think we've seen this in the past, too. We, we, at this stage of the hardware, one of the most valuable commercial opportunities is the OEM opportunity. And that's one of the ways you get there is to show what their hardware can do.
the wall between video game marketers and consumers has crumbled.